Right, so let's have a look at my Milwaukee pack out testing loadout. What's good guys, welcome back to the channel. So today I'm actually gonna be running through all of the essential tools I think you need to test and inspect electrical installations. So I was actually gonna be going to my, to my parents' house to start the EICR, for, you know, following on from last week's video, but one of them's feeling a little bit ill. We're not sure if it's a spicy cough, so I'm not going there. I still came in and dusted off my test kit, sorted it all out after, yeah, not touching it for nearly six months. And I thought, do you know what? I'll still film today. I'll still get some content out for you guys. And actually, some of you have been asking for sort of the pack out tours, um, and the test kit tools and tool tours. So I thought today I'm gonna to go through my testing loadout, run through all of like the individual bits or the, you know, the ones that I think are important. And then at the end, I'll show you how I've got it all kitted out with some other stuff in here, which makes it a sort of all in one testing sort of loadout, which is pretty cool. Before we get into the video, if you haven't already, please like, subscribe, hit that bell button. It supports the channel. And if you're liking the content, you just stay up to date with all the videos I'm gonna have coming out. Yeah, let's, uh, let's get into these tools. So the first and the most important bit of kit in a test kit is of course a multi-function tester. Now there's loads of brands in the UK, loads of options. I'm currently running a QTEC, which I have done for like the last two years. I think it's super easy to use. It's really user friendly. I like the illuminated screen. It's quite modern. None of that sort of calculator screen uh, going on. And yeah, it, it does the job. You know, the accessories are cool and it's compact. I, I really do like it. I, however, uh, learned on a fluke and had a fluke for about six years. To be honest with you, they all do the same thing and I would just get a tester based on budget. I bought a fluke tester secondhand for like 400 quid and then I got this uh, secondhand again a little bit later because I fancied a change and my fluke blown up a little bit and taking a few hits and stuff like that. So yeah, I've also got a TIS MFT Pro, which is a really nice bit of kit. I just think there's a, a skill curve to using it. It doesn't hold your hand too much. I find it quite complicated to do, you know, the most basic things. And while that's fine if you want to get into that and learn that test style, there's also loads of like hidden features and extra functionality. But for me, I just weren't feeling, you know, having to get involved with that. I just want to get something out that works, that is easy to use. And this thing is, you know, it's almost idiot proof. So that's why I uh, I like the QTEC. Now, the reason why this is important is because this is what's gonna be conducting all of your tests. So yeah, you want something you like, you want something that you understand, because this is the key ingredient to doing any sort of testing and inspecting, really. So yeah, just make sure you, you do your research, you buy a quality brand, but don't worry too much about, you know, household brands and the popular ones. Um, I've used them all as well over the years and they all do the same thing. They all have things over the other. Um, but yeah, just pick one that you like and you'll, uh, you'll be fine. So next up is books, 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 books. So specifically guidance notes free. So I've got the old one there, which I'm actually, I'm gonna give away. Obviously it's superseded now, but the, you know, the, the procedures are very much the same and it will come in handy for someone. Um, but yeah, we've got the new one here as well, new and updated for amendment two. So guidance notes is basically the Bible for testing. It runs through, you know, everything at a curriculum level of how to test, specifically every single step, every single detail, the test sequence. It also has, you know, a full breakdown of how to inspect, how to sample, things to look for, all of the regs that, you know, back those rules up. So yeah, it will literally reference, you need to do this because of this. It will have all the relevant tables in there. It's just a super handy book and I recommend anyone testing. I literally have it in my, in my test kit because if you're not sure on anything, you know, I've been testing for, for six, seven years, and I'm pretty good at it, I'd like to think, but there's still some stuff that you need to brush up on or you might have not encountered before. You might get a funny result or a funny reading and just need to quickly reference that. And of course you can Google it, but yeah, just having the book on hand and getting used to navigating the book is super, super useful. Also, code breakers. Now, 
I actually don't like this anymore, but when I first got it, I thought it was amazing. So coding is something that's very subjective, but basically there's three, there's, well, there's four codes. So you've got a C1, a C2, a C3. C1 is like immediate danger, danger of death, and you need to rectify that straight away. C2 is the potential for danger, but nothing that you would consider, you know, needs to be rectified immediately. And C3 is improvement recommended. So something that's rough, something that's not to regs, but isn't gonna hurt anyone, poor labeling, or you would do this better, stuff like that, maintenance stuff, old regs which don't apply, but ideally you would update. So yeah, that's what C3 is for. And then further investigation is for further investigation. So if there's a circuit that leads into a locked room that you can't get access to, you need to code that as a further investigation because you can't get access on the day. The certificate's not gonna be satisfactory until you see what's in that room and so on and so forth. Same as if you spent all day chasing a dodgy read and chasing a fault. After you've conducted an EICR, you spent the rest of your time sort of trying to find a, a, an issue and you can't and it's an issue which is going to you know impair the safety of the installation you might fi it because then you're telling the client look i need to come back and, and find out what's wrong here so yeah you've got to use your engineering judgment and that's what i don't like about this book is it points you in the right direction and it has loads of insight into what you should code stuff but i found myself relying on the book almost too much and not thinking about stuff logically now it is it is good. I would definitely get it, flick through it and, and use it for, you know, a year or however long you need. But I actually, um, I rarely get it out unless I'm like arguing a point with a client or arguing a point with a fellow electrician as to why I've coded something some way. I'll be like, well, let's see what code breakers, you know, says. Sometimes it doesn't agree with me. Most of the time, 99% of the time it does. But I just found it... I didn't de-skill, but it just stopped me sitting there and thinking and making that judgment myself. It made me flip through the book and go, oh yeah, well this says this, so that will do. The only other thing that is actually really good for as well is obviously client-facing stuff. So this will put most stuff in a, in a short, compact, easily explained sort of code or reason as to why. So, you know, and it will give the reg to back it up as well with the reg number. So if you're trying to explain to a client who isn't the most understanding of the installation of the regs, all that stuff, I know that's a big pain point for a lot of electricians who can't, you know, they know what they know, but trying to explain it to a layman can be difficult. So right, we'll have a look at this book because it make, it puts it simply, it references the regs, references the codes, and obviously it can bridge that gap between me being super technical, the client not knowing what I'm going on about, and yeah, this book can sort of, you know, simplify it and uh, just give them what they need to know without bamboozling them with loads of technical knowledge. But yeah, definitely get these books. There's also a couple of, I forgot what they're called, the little pocket guides for testing and stuff like that. They're great too. I used to have them, don't know where they are now. They're super cheap too. But yeah, just get some literature, do some research, and there's loads of information out there that will help you. Next up, thermal imaging or thermal tools. And I find myself doing lots of testing in distribution centers, data centers, um, all sorts of factories, uh, industrial complexes, and basically stuff gets hot. Electrical stuff gets hot, high load stuff gets hot. So something like this little heat gun is great for basically seeing if stuff's hot from a distance. I don't use this too much, but what this is good for is also functional testing. So if there's some high level heating units and stuff like that, and you just want to verify from a distance that they're working, the air temperature around them and stuff. That's what that's great for. Obviously some of these ceilings in these warehouses and these industrial complexes are like 20 meters tall. So the fact that you can just fire that up, get a reading and go, yeah, that's working is really, really important. If I'm actually, you know, wanting to know if there's any thermal damage or get an idea of, you know, the thermal sort of ongoings of a circuit or a piece of kit or something like that, I actually use a thermal imager. So what this is great for is literally showing you the, you know, how hot stuff is getting down to individual bits of components, individual bits of metal. It's just a really insightful tool. I've had it for about two years. I wish I got one years ago. So this client thermal imager is about four or 500 pounds. It's a great little, you know, tool for just, you know, your average electrician. Um, if you were having a professional thermal imaging survey done with a specialist team or contractor or something, they would come in with like 5,000, 10,000, or even 20,000 pound plus cameras that can read, you know, really vast ranges of like emissivity, real specific stuff, which goes over my head a little bit. But what this little uh, thermal imager is great for 
it's just having a quick look. You can basically scan a fuse board without taking the cover off, see if there's any hot points, stuff like that, as well as um, you know BMS panels or motor control centers with all the contactors and all the relays and all that stuff that basically gets hot, which is controlling large loads, motors and stuff. You can literally just run this along the outside, see what's going on, and obviously get an idea for, yeah, if there's any thermal damage, anything you need to look at. Um, you know, you might scan it and go, there's nothing crazy there, but I want to look at that breaker because it's running really, really hot, like above 90 degrees, you know. Um, so there's there's just, yeah, loads of stuff that you can see with this. And also, if you, if you wanted to, you could almost like plug a kettle into a socket um, run it a few times, get that, get that ring cable really, really hot and run this up the wall and you can actually trace like cables through plaster and stuff. So there's loads of little hacks to it. But for me, it's just inspecting like control panels, industrial sort of bits of kit and stuff. And it just gives you a lot more insight and you can take pictures on it too, which is great. So you can take all the pictures and attach them to your EICR or your thermal imaging report. So yeah, it's just that higher level of inspection and it's just a really, really essential tool. Next up, we have clamp meters. So I'm gonna start with the earth leakage clamp meter. So this is a new one that I featured in my last video. It's really, really good actually. And what this one's for is those, it goes up to 100 amps, but it also goes to milliamps as well, real, really low. So this is great for just determining if there's excessive earth leakage on circuits. You know, if you're gonna introduce a load of RCBOs or stuff like that, or if you just wanted to try and track an earth fault as well, you can obviously isolate different parts of the circuit, clamp this round and see what's going on so yeah it just goes super low which is what's important about the earth leakage clamp meter and as you can imagine when you're dealing with rcds like i say or faults this is just going to give you loads of information when you're dealing and trying to sort all of that stuff out i've also got a just a traditional clamp meter so I, I've got like the flute testers with the jaws on and stuff like that. But the reason why I like this one from Qtech is because it's super thin, super small, and it goes up to a thousand amps. So this is great for obviously clamping bigger loads, distribution circuits, stuff like that. And just trying to determine the sort of demand that's going on, loads, faults, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and it's just easy to fit into fuse boards, into small areas and stuff like that. And the connection units of like air handling units or then panel boards that have, you know, all little sort of chambers and stuff. You can just get into tight spaces and it goes up to a thousand amps but yeah it just doesn't go below one so it isn't an earth leakage clamp meter it hasn't got that range that's why I'm running two of those next up another Qtech product I have the what is it actually called it's the hazardous voltage pen I think basically it's a um, touch voltage tester so you flick it on it's got a literally a probe on the end you want to keep your hands behind the finger guard and you can just touch bits of metal to see if there's a touch voltage it's great for like earth bars, switch rooms, um, HV enclosures, all that stuff where if you're not too sure or you're going to a site which has clearly been neglected or we would go to sites where there's been a cannabis farm and all the electrics has just been like run through, abused, bodged and obviously yeah just not done by competent people so if you're just in that environment where you're trying to work safely you're trying to isolate and stuff like that but you need to get into the environment or you just need to be confident where you're working this is great because you just walk around going bang 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 see if there's any touch voltages and yeah you just have that one point of contact as well so you can just yeah walk around with it and yeah it's uh it goes up to 600 volts ac and it's uh it's a handy little tool for those really specific situations again some of the domestic guys might be watching this and going look i don't need this 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 and this but yeah this is just from my my day-to-day -day as a commercial industrial and domestic electrician these are the sort of things that just make my life easier when uh, when testing. Next up, cable tags. So these are the wire marker tapes. So you basically pull them out. Um, yeah, they've got loads of numbers on and then you can cut them off and then you can just wrap them around cables, wrap them around bits and bobs. So this is a really minor, minor little tool. You can pick them up that, you know, from any wholesalers. This is a 3M one and it basically goes from zero to nine. And why this is good is because if you're doing like a a commercial EICR with five fuse boards and hundreds of circuits and you are gonna have to do remedial work on those circuits and there might be a junction box or something like that. What you can do is quickly isolate the circuit when you're inspecting, when you find the fault or find what's wrong and then just tag it with a number. Write that number in a little notebook or on the um, schedule of inspections. Then if you land the remedial work, when you come back, you'll be able to open the enclosure and go, oh yeah, I tagged up that cable, that cable, that cable, or these circuits in this fuse board with numbers and then you can check 
your schedule inspections go, oh yeah, that's what was wrong with that circuit. Now a domestic consumer unit with five circuits in, not necessary. But this is for those situations where we would go and inspect a factory with 10 boards, again, like 500 circuits, and we're finding like loads of stuff where it hasn't been tested for like 20 years. So then we're in a fuse board, I would do one, Oh, one, 102, 103, and I'd write all of the faults next to it of what needs sorting out, and then I would know what circuits what, or it might not even be me as well. It might be on a big firm, there might be someone else going back to do the remedial work, or you might be off that day or something. So you can provide all that information and just make that remedial work go a lot smoothly, a lot easier, and just make your life easy. So yeah, don't neglect little marking tools like this. Obviously you can use a Sharpie or something too, but just by having that range of zero to nine, you've got loads of like combinations of numbers there and yeah it's just a useful little tip on uh, on bigger inspections finally <laughs> and often neglected is the wonder lead so you can always always judge the caliber of a tester a, a tester and inspecting electrician a 2391 electrician if they have a wonder lead because bonding is really important earthing and bonding is actually part of the electricity at work regs it's a legal sort of statutory requirement to test and verify that that's in place so you know it's rare that the bond well sometimes it is but it's rare that the bond is directly below the the consume unit especially in commercial industrial so you need to go for a walk with your wonder lead and you need to verify the continuity and the resistance of these bonds now obviously domestically you might have gas oil and water but uh, commercially industrially you could have lightning protection you could have structural steel you could have earth pits you could have like equipment bonds so the the ahu might be bonded yeah all sorts of stuff like that you might have clean earth bars and and just loads of bits that need to be verified and tested so yeah that is why that is essential but also a lot of people don't do it i'll, I'll be honest i've worked at a lot of firms and worked with a lot of people and you can tell that they don't do it because they don't have a wonder lead so it's just something that's really important often neglected i think it's getting better now earthing is like i feel like something that a lot generally like when i was going through college and, and learning no one could really tell me about earthing i'm barely scratching the surface of of how earthing works and stuff like that now but i've put that work in to educate myself on it but earthing i find is like something that most you know sparks don't get taught because no one really knows enough about it it's getting better definitely in the last five years knowledge is being shared there's great people online and stuff like that and loads of people are learning about earthing but for me i just find just being 10 years in the industry it's probably one of the least knowledgeable topics when it comes to electricians you know so yeah that's probably why it gets neglected a little bit i don't know but yeah this is an essential bit of kit for uh, testing those bonds. So these are, yeah, what I would deem essential. Obviously there's a lot more that goes with this and there's a lot more to the testing and inspection process than the kit you have. Now don't get it confused. It's not about the kit you have, it's about how you inspect, how you test. And you're only gonna do that with experience. I'm confident enough to say that, you know, the initial sort of, I don't know, 10 or 20 EICRs that I'd done, I was pouring my heart into them. I thought I was doing a good job, you know, um, and and I tested every circuit and, and I looked at as much as I can. But now I know what I know now, five, 10 years later, like I weren't doing it <laughs> to the level that I'm doing it now. And that's just experience. And you can't knock anyone for that because you don't know it all. No one knows it all. Always learning, especially in a trade as complex as, uh, you know, being an electrician. So, yeah, you're always going to level up and the kit really isn't that important. Like you could have a tester, you could have a wonder lead and guidance notes free and you'll be sweet. You don't need any of this other stuff, but they're just, I deem essentials because they make the testing process quicker. They save clients money because you're, you're doing it at a better rate. And yeah, they just allow you to uh, get a deeper insight into the, into the installation, especially more complex ones like uh, commercial and industrial. So yeah, there's just loads of little things that you can use these for to enhance that level of testing and inspecting. But like I say, you do not need all of this. You just need the essentials, tester, R2 lead, and um, yeah, GM3, which you'll probably grab if you've done your 2391 anyway, because it's like the syllabus for the course. So yeah, I'm gonna get all this packed into my pack out, my Milwaukee pack out, and then we will uh, have a look at how I have my test kit loaded out for day-to-day -day testing. Right, so before we get into my pack out testing loadout, I just want 
wanted to talk about this thing. So funnily enough, I actually got sent this thing um, like last August. <laughs> Used it a couple of times, but then I was off the tools. So I couldn't really um, shout about it too much. But yeah, Hampshire Generators sent it out to me. So big shout out to them. I've got a discount code and stuff like that too. I'll talk about that in a sec, but I just want to run through the features. So this is a, a battery storage sort of power bank, basically a portable power station. And it's, um, yeah, it's a serious one. So you charge it via mains in which is super quick i think it's at 25 percent because i've let it run down but yeah it's charging about two three hours and then you can charge by solar as well which they sent me the solar panels which i've never actually used but we'll have a little look at them quickly but yeah that's how you charge it it's got a light on the front as you can see the runtime adjusts as you apply the load so like the second bright light it drops down to 50 hours of runtime it's using three watts so yeah that's pretty cool that whole interface there's also an app as well that you can use to obviously really micromanage and see what what you're doing with it remotely it's got USB C USB uh, A fast charge USB it's also got like a DC car charger yeah 12 volt DC sockets and stuff too so that's cool and then around this side the main event you've got two 13 amp sockets also euro sockets or whatever and this is like a interface uh, plug so that you could have like a couple of these connected together for obviously a larger amount of power but yeah it's um it's really smart it's important for eicrs because you might have someone working from home and they want to keep the wi-fi on for a really important call or you just might want to have a cup of tea charge something and obviously when you're in the middle of an eicr or a mains change or something like that obviously you can have this charge get it out and it will uh, it'll get you out of a sticky situation or just offer a great perk to using you over other electricians because you're running with one of these really really impressive you can grab them from hampshire generators use code eco5 to get five percent off like i say these are expensive bits of kit so even that five percent will make a difference and yeah let's quickly uh, run outside and see what this solar panel's saying because i've been dying to try that out all right so let's get this this plugs in here like so, and then that should kick in. There you go, it's charging 22 hours, 15 hours, 13 hours, 11 hours, 10 hours, eight hours, that's crazy. Yeah, now it's just gone up to 22 hours, 23 hours because the, the sun's gone behind the cloud, but in direct sunlight, eight to nine hours, I mean, the, the sun was still obscured, there's still clouds in the sky, so maybe when um, it's completely clear skies, it might, you know, it might charge in six, seven hours, which considering it takes two hours to charge off the mains is, is crazy. And obviously that's a completely portable kit. So that's, uh, that's super smart, especially for the remote work that we do sometimes, you know, in the middle of nowhere, doing connections and stuff like that before there's anything there. This could be a real game changer. But yeah, let's, uh, let's go have a look at my test kit. Right, so let's have a look at my Milwaukee pack out testing loadout there she is so first of all stickers just because i'm a little bit sad um residual stickers there lockout tag out back from lockdown 2020 for some reason i thought lockout tag out had two t's in it so it was lot i don't know why but no one mentioned it e5 vo prem and the cow card as well that's cool so that will just prove the uh you know that your test is calibrated there or thereabouts it's a, it's a good indicator just sticks to the inside of the case and then a random sticker there in here the main compartment i've got all the sort of peripherals the heat gun the thermal imager q -Tech clamp mega clamp pen then below I've just got GN3 and the code breakers and then my tester. It's just like the middle compartment, everything's easy to access and yeah, just all those bits of kit just in nice one nice place. Obviously there is a little QTEC bag but you can fit nothing in and it's not hard wearing. There's obviously this super solid, it will last on site and I throw it about and you can see it's had a load of dents and chunks taken out of it and stuff and all my expensive stuff in there is, uh, is still sweet. So that's important. In this sort of tray here, I've just got some essential hand tools. So long nose, cutters, this screwdriver, which I think is being discontinued. We've got some more coming in at loadout. Yeah, it's a flip blade. So you literally pull that out. Really hard to do one handed. Put it there and then yeah, you can pop that in change it around and the reason why I love this is because it's a it's a ph not a pz so I don't like that but it's a, it's a phillips and a flathead on one driver so you essentially can just run around with this and you're covered for most situations and then it's got some other 
some other bits too, one double ended one too. So yeah, that's just a, a nice little driver to cover me. I've got this little Klein inspection light, which is cool. Again, I've got, is that dead? Oh no, I've left that running probably in there. I always do that. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's dead. You can just charge it on the collar there, look, which is cool. But yeah, um, nice little inspection light, big Sharpie, and then the inspection mirror. So this should have been one of the essentials actually, because this is great for, in fact, let me show you. So this is great for seeing if bus bars are connected properly, just in the bottom, run it along. Obviously that one's sweet, I know, but yeah, you can look in the mirror and just see if you've got any loose connections or anything like that. So um, yeah. Nice nifty little tool and you can grab them for like 20 quid. So yeah, pretty nice. So apart from that, there's essential tools in there. That's pretty much the only tools I've got in there apart from a few more in here. I'll take this out of the way and I just use this as a bin for the leads basically. There's, um, you can spend more time organizing them with Velcro wraps and stuff like that. But for me, it's coming in and out so often that I'm just really not fussed. Yeah, the Q-Tech stuff's nice, you know, nothing special, but the leads do the job. You've got the probe lead there, all the, uh, all the other bits I did have I used to before I had all this stuff I used to have like um, plug sockets on click uh, plugs and and all sorts of like adapters commando adapters and stuff like that and I think they're handy but I think they can also make you lazy you're less likely to unscrew something and have a look at it if you can just plug in and get the result in here I've got just uh, random bits so wagos fuses socket screws back box fixer as well just those things that you know there's nothing worse than unscrewing some in and the fuse is blown or you know there's a screw missing or something like that and then next minute it's oh you come and inspected and then you know this is wrong so these are just little bits to get you out of a tight spot and then i've got a torque screwdriver in there too this doesn't always live in here it, it tends to stay in here but obviously if i'm running a like a backpack to um to get up to london or something like that then i'll chuck that in there instead of bringing this whole kit generally what i'll do is i'll come i'll test and i'll talk up all at the same time i actually used to have my labeler in here as well now that's in a separate bag just because i've got loads of accessories with that but i actually had my brother labeler in there too so at one point this was like my finisher sort of toolbox because you could just bring it in test label talk yeah be done with it but now it's uh it's more test focused and in here i've got loads of lock offs so tags with all sorts of different companies i've worked for on there um supreme lock so i use this when i can Sometimes you have like an authorization engineer who's um, like, oh, you can't use a combination lock because someone might guess the code and, and re-energize what I've isolated because they want to kill me that bad. But yeah, I've got loads of normal ones in here too. The multi-lock sort of adapters, the different ones for different breakers. That's like a generic MCCD one. And I've also got the, the NSX Schneider ones too. Yeah, for the Schneider MCCBs. So yeah, um, just loads of random stuff in there. And I just keep all my keys on a lanyard that I got from a trade show. I think it's from a Lex, like 2020 or something. I just have all the keys on one thing there. And that normally satisfies the, uh, the most particular of um, authorizing engineers or, or people like that. And then here I've just got some tape as well, just cause you always need it. And it's just in there filling that gap. But that is it. That is my, uh, that's my testing loadout. So let me know what you think. Is there anything missing? Is there anything you would do differently? But yeah, that's how I, I tend to run it. I'll, uh, I'll shut the camera back on the tripod and we'll, uh, we'll outro the video. So guys, that is my electrical testing essentials. Now I say essentials, they're essential for me now that I've used them. But like I said before, you don't need all of this stuff. Not all of it is essential depending on the sector you work in, your experience and the type of, of buildings and installations that you're you're inspecting and testing. However, in the variety of work that I do and the sectors I work in, this sort of covers me for everything and allows me to yeah, provide quite a conclusive EICR when I when I do do them. Now, this video was filmed because we couldn't get to my parents' house today, like I said, but we'll be back there next week, putting this test kit through its paces, putting the eco flow through its paces, and uh, yeah, just using all the stuff that we spoke about today. So hopefully I can demo it more. But if you're interested in any of the tools and the eco flow, well, the tools, the tools are available on Loadout, my tool shop, most of them, so you can pick them up from there. And the EcoFlow is available from Hampshire Generators. Don't forget, use code ECO5 to get that 5% off. If you haven't already, guys, please like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. It really supports the channel. And if you're liking videos in the workshop or videos out on site, the content that I love to do, then uh, yeah, you'll just stay up to date on all the stuff I've got coming out. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.